One of the unique challenges that a marketing researcher has to deal with when using secondary data is evaluating the quality of that secondary data. This is a necessary step for a researcher and one that's often overlooked by people without a research background. Without a research background, people find secondary data, treat it as true, and then move forward. A real marketing researcher doesn't have that luxury. We recognize that there's often limitations or almost always limitations to any study. So we need to identify those limitations and then make a decision whether or not we can use that secondary data for our purposes. There's five overall questions that we usually ask ourselves when evaluating secondary data to make a decision whether or not we can use it for our current research question. First, we need to evaluate what was the purpose of the original study, who collected that information, what particular information they collected, how they actually collected that information, and is that information from one particular secondary source consistent with other secondary data sources? While we ask these five questions, there's three buckets of answers that we may place in the answers to our questions. First, when we answer some of those features, we might realize they're positive features, enhancing the quality of the secondary data in our mind. Then we'll notice usually there are some negative aspects of that secondary data. And then finally, and most frustratingly, Many times, the necessary details that we want to know about how secondary data was generated are simply not available. So they're simply unknown features, and we have to make a judgment call about whether or not we can live with those uncertainties. What was the purpose of the original study? If the original study's purpose and our current research question and needs don't have a lot of overlap, the secondary data may not suit us as much as, much as we would hope it would. On the other hand, if the original study's purpose and our needs are closely overlapped, that's usually a good sign that the secondary data will be relevant for us. The Bureau of Labor Statistics publishes annually an American Time Use Survey. The study does exactly what it says it does. It is a survey that provides a nationally representative sample of where, how, and with whom Americans are spending their time. One of the neat things about this data set is that it goes back to 2003, so we can observe changes in individuals' time, uh, use of their times. In this example, I've simplified the structure of the data into four main categories. Across the span of a 24-hour day, the percentage of time that people spend sleeping, doing work and work-related activities, doing relaxing and leisure activities, and some other activity. And then, I divided the data set into men and women across the beginning in 2003 into 2014. Looking at these results, a few things become clear. First, both groups are spending a little bit more time sleeping today than they were previously. Men are spending a little less time doing work and work-related activities, although their overall amount of time is greater than women. But we see that women are spending a little bit more time overall doing work and work-related activities. We see both groups are spending more time doing relaxing and leisure activities. Given that both men and women are spending a little more time sleeping and have a little more time for relaxing and leisure activities, we may be tempted to conclude that people are happier. However, the purpose of this original study was merely to document exactly how people's time were spent, not to assess how happy they were. Thus, if the purpose of our current research is to find out how happy people are in the past compared to now, this study may not be serving us as closely as we would hope it would. Instead, an alternative study, the Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index study, might be better suited for our purposes if our goal is to track how happy Americans are. What you're seeing here is a longitudinal study that tracks people's reflections on how happy they were and how low their stress was in the previous day. From 2008 to 2014, we see that the percentage of people expressing a lot of happiness and enjoyment in their previous day is relatively stable, as is the percent of people with a lot of stress or worry in their day. Since the purpose of this study was to track happiness and stress, this study may suit us better than the previous study if our objective was to find out over people's overall happiness levels. On the other hand, the second question we ask ourselves when evaluating secondary data is who collected the information. As we're evaluating the source of the original research, there's two things that we're looking for. First, is there any evidence that that researcher may have had an agenda or a bias when conducting the research? Secondly, we're looking for evidence that the researcher actually has the requisite ex expertise necessary to properly conduct the research study. Here's an interesting study that illustrates why we should be suspicious when we have reason to believe that the people behind a study may actually have an agenda. This paper is called The Relationship Between Funding Source and Conclusion Among Nutrition-Related Scientific Articles. This comes from an academic journal called PLOS Medicine. You can access this study online for free. What they did was they found 72 published scientific studies about the nutritional value of beverages. 
Then they split those 72 studies into two different groups. First, they categorized studies that were funded actually by the beverage industry. Then they put the other group of studies as those who used other funding sources, such as academic grants. Then they analyzed the results of those studies and characterized them as whether the results are favorable to the beverage industry, neutral to the beverage industry, or unfavorable to the beverage industry. Now, if the funding source had absolutely no impact on the findings of a study, we would expect to see that these two stacked bar charts would be exactly the same. However, if you look on the left, you'll notice that if the beverage industry funded an article, a greater proportion of them were scored as favorable. Indeed, a larger proportion were also scored as neutral. Now, this doesn't inherently mean that a stud an academic study funded by the beverage industry is automatically biased. However, this does illustrate that source effects may impact the results of a particular secondary data study. The third question we ask when evaluating secondary research studies is what information was collected? When we inspect a secondary study closely, did the study actually measure what it appears they measure? Here's an interesting example from this article called The Association of Point-of-Sale Cigarette Marketing with Cravings to Smoke, results from a cross-sectional population-based study. This study looked at what induced people to have smoking cravings amongst people who are already smokers. In particular, it was looking closely to see if point-of-sale cigarette displays, point-of-sale cigarette advertisements, and point-of-sale cigarette promotions had a relationship with people having smoking cravings when they were exposed to that advertising content. When quickly scanning the results of the article, it appears that point-of-sale tobacco displays have a strong effect on inducing smoking cravings in smoking individuals. Point-of-sale tobacco ads have a moderate effect on inducing smoking cravings in smoking uh, individuals. And tobacco, pro tobacco promotions did not have a statistically significant relationship with people having smoking cravings. However, it is necessary for us to look a little closer and see exactly how these things were measured to see if this conclusion is actually valid. It turns out this study wasn't about actual exposure to tobacco marketing, but instead someone's recollection of exposure to tobacco marketing. Look on the left-hand side. These three questions represent the survey questions that were asked of smokers when they were reflecting on their exposure to tobacco marketing. For example, look at the first one. When you are in a store in your neighborhood, how often do you notice tobacco ads? The respondent answered on a one to five scale, never to always. These three different measures correspond to these three different tobacco displays, tobacco ads, and tobacco promotions. So again, it wasn't their actual exposure, it was their recollection of exposure. In addition, smokers weren't actually reporting their actual level of smoking, smoking cravings. They were recalling their level of smoking cravings when they were in a store that had tobacco advertising. If you look on the right here, they asked the three following questions. When you are in a store in your neighborhood that sells tobacco products, how often do you, one, feel a craving for a cigarette, two, feel like nothing will be better than smoking a cigarette, and three, feel like all you want is a cigarette. And again, for each one of these three questions, people responded on the same five point never to always scale. So upon closer inspection, this study didn't measure individuals' exposure to tobacco ads and whether it caused smoking cravings. Instead, it was an individual's recollection of seeing tobacco marketing and their recollection of feeling smoking cravings at a store that sells tobacco. This was the correlation that was, that was found in the study not a direct causal effect of actual exposure and actual craving. This example does a nice job of illustrating why marketing researchers need to evaluate what was actually measured rather than what just what might appear to be have been measured when we're evaluating secondary data studies. If you were a policymaker trying to decide new legislation for tobacco advertising in stores, we might want to be hesitant about using this individual study to reach any broad conclusions because it wasn't a direct study of people's exposure to tobacco advertising, instead it was just their recollection. This study actually did a very nice job of reporting all of its data collection procedures. That's why I was able to use it for this particular example. Another question that we need to ask when evaluating secondary data is how was the information attained? First, does the sampling method ensure that sample is likely to be a fair representative sample of the entire population? Secondly, is it possible that the way the data was collected may have actually biased the original responses? 
These are two questions that we have to worry about when we design our own study as well. For the first one, let's consider the following example. Let's say that we want to find out if San Diego voters support some form of public financing for a new Chargers stadium. The issue of using public money to help finance professional sports team stadiums has become a rather hot topic. Numerous articles, books, news pieces have been covered, have covered this issue of that financing private stadiums using some, sort, some form of tax dollars may not be in the best interest of the public. However, consider this following example. According to these results, 69% of San Diegans are okay with the idea of raising hotel taxes to fund a $1.8 billion stadium, an extra meeting space in downtown San Diego. However, it turns out that these numbers probably don't mean too much for likely San Diego voters. Because these numbers actually came from an online opt-in poll from a news article titled poll will you support the charger stadium tax hike if you look at the very bottom you'll notice this poll itself also knows that it's not meant to be representative it says this is not a scientific poll and is for entertainment purposes only the results of this poll are not valid for awarding prizes i'm not really sure what prizes we're awarding but it is true that this poll is only for entertainment purposes clearly the type of person who went to this website and then chose to answer this poll with no incentive what whatsoever is unlikely to be the same type of person who represents all of San Diego. Therefore, we can't trust that these numbers are accurate, an accurate representation of likely San Diego voters. This is an example of a self-selection bias. People who are self-selecting into a study and our inability to control, um, control the type of person so that they are representative of the whole population. Consider this example. Now this is a slightly different question so we have to be careful about how we interpret these numbers. But this survey asked people in San Diego if public money should be used to build a new Charger Stadium. In this case, only 36% reported as saying yes. Now, if we look a little closer, this particular study was conducted by Survey USA, a popular polling house. And if we look about how they performed the poll, let's take a look at the methodology used for this study. Survey USA used a random digit dialed method. In other words, they had a system that randomly dialed numbers that they believe would correspond with people in San Diego. Then, based on individuals' responses, uh, not only to the survey questions, but also to their age, gender, ethnicity, and so on, they weighted these sampling respondents so that it, based on the US Census, it mapped on to what we would expect to see of all San Diego residents. Now, this particular method here would be considered a form of probabilistic sampling. In other words, this type of sample should be representative of San Diegans, while the previous example of the opt-in online poll is almost certainly not representative. Even if the sample is representative of the population that we intend to study, we need to verify whether the way the secondary data was generated may have contaminated the result. In fact, this exact issue has been discussed in the popular news media in 2016 over the lawsuit of Trump University. If you haven't followed the news, do a quick search for Trump University lawsuit and you'll find extensive information. For our purposes, it suffice to say that the Trump University is presently being sued in civil court uh, for fraud, uh, false advertising, and unfair business practices. One of the ways that Trump University has defended itself in saying that it wasn't practicing anything unfair is that it says that 98% of all the individuals who completed satisfaction surveys at the end of Trump University events uh, were actually satisfied with the experience. If you go to 98%approval.com right now, you can actually go and download hundreds of megabytes of PDFs of uh, anonymized event satisfaction sheets. Here's one being represented right now, and there are literally hundreds upon hundreds of pages of this. In aggregate, Trump University claims that 98% of people were happy. Now on its face, that would seem to be a very strong defense. It turns out the way the satisfaction surveys were conducted draws into question whether or not we can actually trust these results. From a New York Times article, there were some individuals who reported that the way they collected satisfaction surveys suggest that we can't trust this information. For example, for example, Robert Gilo claims that the teacher of the class actually pleaded and begged for them to have to give the best possible score, otherwise that the person was going to need to teach again. Well clearly, someone standing there and pleading for a nice score could contaminate someone's response when evaluating them. Another individual, in this second example here, says that the university mentor actually refused to leave the room while someone was completing the satisfaction survey. As you can imagine, Someone standing in the same room while you're evaluating them could certainly tend to bias your results upwards because it feels awkward and uncomfortable to give someone a negative rating while you're standing in front of them. This is an example of the way in which the data being generated may have actually contaminated the responses. We as marketing researchers need to be sensitive that these types of 
uh, data collection practices could contaminate the data in such a way that it makes it unusable for our particular purposes. When we're looking at secondary data, we often can find more than one source of information that provides useful insights. What we need to ask then is how consistent is the information with other secondary data? For example, let's imagine we want the answer to the following question. What percent of U.S. adults own cell phones? What percent of U.S. adults own smartphones? In particular, what's been the last three-year trend of cell phone and smartphone ownership? Well, GFK does the Amer survey of the American consumer, a tool that you've seen in previous videos. Now what they do is they use a representative sampling technique, but importantly, what they use is face-to-face in-home surveys. Pew Research, another reputable independent survey and research house, they also do studies, and in this case, you'll see an example of where they collect information about smartphone and cell phone ownership. They use telephone interviews some via landline and some via cell phone. So now we have two entirely different studies where we can see the rate of cell phone and smartphone ownership. If you look in the upper left hand chart, we can see that both GFK's survey the American consumer and the Pew Research Center's report about smartphone ownership remain relatively consistent, usually no more than two percentage points away from one another. Similarly, when it comes to actual cell phone ownership, we see both GFK's method and Pew Research's method are reporting very similar numbers. Two different research methods are generating very similar results. This adds credibility to each of the numbers, suggesting that this is the truth 